Oh, well Welcome and welcome back. I'm Carhu the Great Bear of the North, and this is the Planet Zoo. Specifically, Car Zoo Alexandria. Now, off camera, I developed this area. I built this lion head fountain for some reason. I'm not entirely sure why. And I filled this in. And it occurs to me that this would have been a great place to put like a small exhibit, like an aardvark exhibit or something like that. Except, yeah, I built the pathway off the surface of the ground, which, in retrospect, would have been so much cooler if I'd had a little exhibit in here, could have put maybe the entrance in through here, because this is actually the pathway to the staff area, but anyways, that's, that's that, so this is, you know, this is kind of what it looks like overhead, added some canal pool areas there, but Specifically, let's get into today's topic. You've already seen the videos, but I'm going to build an underground temple, like Abu Simbel kind of a thing, maybe Petra a little bit, in along this area. And then we're going to go in, and it's going to be like, oh, and then we're going to see a whole bunch of exhibit animals, specifically dealing with the underworld. But I'll explain how these things all link on the flip side. So for now, time lapse! All right, I will get to the building of this temple itself. But first, let me talk about the person that this temple is kind of based off of, because this temple is based off of the temple of Abu Simbel down in Aswan, Egypt. And the temple at Abu Simbel is to Ramses II, also known as Ramses the Great. And before I get to the temple at Abu Simbel, which is a fantastic story in and of itself, I just want to talk about Ramses II first, because this character, if, if, if there are any ancient Egyptian pharaohs, that are notorious enough to be compared to Alexander the Great. Ramses II is that pharaoh. He became prince regent when he was 14 years old, and from there, his life just kept going. Just like Alexander the Great became a leader very, very young, so too did Ramses II. After battle, after battle, incorporating mixed-use warfare or mixed in uh, mixed uh, mixed unit tactics into his battles, he managed to just outmaneuver and outforce everybody else. The, the Syrians, the Hittites, the Nubians, the Libyans, just everybody fell to Ramses II. In fact, it's believed by some that Ramses II was the pharaoh during the biblical Exodus. I don't have any sources for that that argue it because everything in terms of that is 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 very theoretical, very hypothetical, very circumstantial, so I'm not going to source that. But Ramses II was absolutely fantastic. He was nearly a hundred years old when he died, and he just absolutely conquered everything. More specifically, he also conquered Nefertiti, who was his most famous consort. I believe she was his actual wife, but Nefertiti is widely regarded as the most beautiful of all of the ancient Egyptian women, including Cleopatra. Yeah, I said that. Deal with it. And, and Ramses is just this absolutely fascinating figure, to me at least. Now, I don't want to get too much onto Ramses, although I could. So let's talk about Abu Simbel. About 3,000 years ago, in the southern reaches of the Nile, in Upper Egypt, near the city of Aswan. They built a giant temple. It took 20 years to build this larger temple. There was a smaller temple, a little bit close to it. And when I say small, it's, it's still a massive temple. It's just the smaller of the two. And this larger one, the entrance to the temple, this was cut out of the rock at a river bend of the Nile. And it was carved out of the rock, and there were four massive, absolutely massive statues of, of Ramses that would flank the entrance. They were, they were 20 meters tall, or 66 feet tall. And like these are absolutely massive 
massive things. You've probably seen pictures of this, but th this is just... It's just an amazing thing to me. And then inside, there's a hypostyle, which is a hallway um, filled with a whole bunch of columns, but in this case, the columns are actually further statues. And then you go into another room, and then there's more statues. And then you go into the final internal sanctuary, and there's a whole bunch of like side passages and everything, but that's the basic layout. You just go deeper and deeper and deeper, and everywhere you are dwarfed by the mammoth scale of these things. Like, these are 66 feet tall. Like, that's... That's that's massive. That is absolutely massive. And although we don't have we don't have um we don't have story we don't we don't have statues that big in in Planet Coaster at uh, Planet Zoo rather I did try to instead I used obelisks for this for this function. It's still very large. You still get dwarfed by them and it, you know, I don't really have Egyptian hieroglyphs again in this game, so just kind of using the, the the temple golden figures because I like the the gold relief on the dark black of the obsidian obelisks. At least that's how I see it. I don't know if you guys like it, but I very much enjoy it. And this temple, what's really amazing about this temple is, I mean, obviously it's sheer size, the person that it's dedicated to, the history of the statues. But specifically, it's in 1958, I want to say maybe 59, certainly before 1960, there was, there was a plan to build a dam, a large dam at Aswan that would create a massive reservoir that would unfortunately flood the temple of Ramses II, the great temple, the temples at Abu Simbel. And... They didn't want that to happen, said UNESCO. And in one of the largest and most, most be, in my mind, um, projects to translocate something like this. Remember, we're talking at least four 20 meter tall, sta tall statues. And this is just the entrance. This isn't the actual building itself. They, they moved them over the span of four years and costing, I think, something like $500 million, half a billion dollars in today's currency, they would cut them into stone blocks. I think they averaged about 25 to 30 tons each and meticulously moved them up above what would become the new water level, and they rebuilt them piece by piece by piece under this giant concrete dome because they had to, because these these temples were originally carved into the rock, they had to build up these rock hills around them. So they built these mountains that then they put the temple in, but the entire temple was covered by this concrete dome to protect everything. It's absolutely fascinating, everything that they did here. It's just one of those things where you look at history, you look at the stories, and this is 3,000 years old these temples and it's almost insulting to destroy that for the sake of hydroelectricity I mean I understand the need for hydroelectricity but surely there's got to be a way to do it without destroying these places because even though the new location is a UNESCO World Heritage Site it's not the original location these buildings have been there in the new location for less than 60 years they were in the original location for 3,000 years. More than 3,000 years, I think 3,200 years. So it's just one of those things that, as a historian, as an archeologist, as an anthropologist, and I say that in the sense that I'm trained to do that. I haven't practiced any of those, but I am trained in those. It's, it's just disappointing to see things like this, and this happens all over the world every single day when ancient history is destroyed for the sake of modern sensibilities, be it electricity, be it cheap electricity, be it modern, you know, iconoclast sensibilities. It's just, it's just frustrating to see it, because we can't get that back. We can't get back 3,000 years of history. We simply can't. 
And one of these days, I will visit Abu Simbel. I will visit that, and I will probably... I don't know. I, I, I don't know how I would feel when I get there. But the point is... It disappoints me that we do things like this. Anyways, that's the sidetrack. Back to this. So what I'm trying to do in this temple is... I wanted to create a place that was underground that would have a whole bunch of different exhibit animals and we've got scorpions and we've got turtles and we've got snakes because in many many cultures the underground is where is is associated with death so i figured the sacred scarab beetle the the scorpions these were magical figures these were magical creatures in ancient egyptian society in ancient egyptian religion so I figured we'd put them underground, we'd put this kind of like a secret temple, which is why it's kind of like just tucked in a corner there between the Greek village and the Hippodrome. It's not, it doesn't have like this massive, it doesn't have a place of prominence like the Ionic and the Doric temples do. It's simply there. And I like that. I like, and this is where the hypostyle hall is, with just massive columns within the center of the building. And I just like the scale of it. There's so many things about this that I really enjoy. Really, really do enjoy. But there's so many similarities between a lot of Greek and Egyptian temple architecture in the sense of the columns, in, in the overall layout. So by the time Alexander came in and conquered Egypt. Although it's, it's more complicated than that, but we're just going to go with that. By the time Alexander comes in and conquers Egypt, there's been... I mean, by this time, the, the height of Egypt was 700 years ago, 1,000 years ago, if not more. But yet, there was still... And there was plenty of trade, obviously, across the eastern Mediterranean. So these weren't f completely foreign ideas. But when the Greeks came over and they created a long-lasting society in Egypt that lasted for more than 2,000 years, they, it was really easy to kind of incorporate the two things. Because Greek architecture and Egyptian architecture, Greek architecture was clearly influenced by Egyptian architecture, at least I think so. If not directly, at least indirectly. With the whole rows of, of columns and even a lot of the column structure, some of the uh, the ancient Egyptians used a lot more what are called caryatids, which is statues acting as columns. And my, my terminology might be slightly off. It's been 20 years since I studied this. But they would use statues acting as columns, which are called caryatids. The Greeks did it too, but they didn't do it as often. But other than that, they're still very, very similar with the with the way that the column is is designed, the way that it's tapered, even the way that it's, you know, the capital kind of blossoms out. You will see that, certainly, in some Egyptian temples. I believe Luxor. Do not quote me on this. Do not quote me on this. I'm, I'm going off the top of my head, not from my notes here. But I believe Luxor's capitals, Luxor's columns, had um, lotus capitals. I want to say lotus. But anyways... So, we're getting in and into this temple, into this hypostyle. I know there isn't a lot of, you know, real decoration inside here. I Normally, this would be covered in statues, or this would be covered in hieroglyphs, but it doesn't come easy to planet co to planet zoo to add these things in and so i didn't want to spend the hours upon hours upon hours of making television screens and then adding the hieroglyphs through it everything but this this does definitely work and so i think the ultimate goal with this temple is to give people a place to see these animals in kind of this dark, mysterious kind of a location to give these animals the respect that they deserve. Because these are 
I'm not going to say holy animals, because I don't know if I would go that far. But they're certainly associated with magic and the divine. Are scorpions and, and scarab beetles. But, so I wanted to, when, when the guests go into this temple, which doesn't really have a name, it's not dedicated to anybody, it's just the Chthonic temple. Chthonic meaning underground or from the earth. So when we're building this temple, I just wanted it to be this underground thing, this hidden away hole, because I don't like the way that exhibit animals are done in Planet Zoo, and I don't really think it fits with the rest of the zoo to just have random exhibit animals scattered throughout. So this temple I thought was pretty cool. And I, I just enjoy the aesthetics of it too. And just a reference to Abu Simbo is 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 beautiful. Oh, oh, about Abu Simbo. The guy that discovered Abu Simbo was a guy by the name of Johann Burkhardt, who also discovered Petra. <laughs> so this one guy, I mean, obviously people knew about Abu Simbo and Petra before, but he's the one that popularized it to, repopularized it in the 18, I want to say 60s, 1870s, repopularized it to a European audience. So this random guy is just a traveler, and he's just walking along, and he sees sticking out of the sand at, at near Aswan is the frieze, the, the, you know, the top part of the temple. And he just sees it, and he's like, oh, I wonder what this is. And then he tells a, a friend of his, and then this friend comes back several years later and tries to dig in, doesn't make it. And then he comes back a little bit later on and does eventually make it in. And from there, we get the glory that is Abu Simba. Like, for so many thousands of years the majesty and glory of ancient Egypt was was pretty much lost to us. It was a completely mysterious civilization. And th I, I'm, I'm so thankful, at least this is the story, I'm so thankful to Napoleon's ditch diggers. They were digging a latrine just west, I believe, of Alexandria. And they came across a large stone that had three different types of writing on it. One of which was hieroglyphs, which by the late 19th century, by the 19th century, nobody really understood what hieroglyphs represented anymore. And the other two were ancient Greek and a different kind of, of Greek. I believe it was Coptic Greek. And we knew Greek, we knew Coptic Greek, and we realized that they said the same thing. So translators figured out, well, linguists figured out, well, if these two say the same thing, maybe the first one says the same thing. And lo and behold, it did. And then they could bring out the names of, I believe, a pharaoh. I think it was Khufu, Khufu or Khephren, um, one of the, the great pyramid um, pharaohs. And it may be completely conflating different stories here. But they, they figured it out. And the names of pharaohs are in like an oval with a line in the end, which is called a, um, a cartouche. And they realized that this was all talking about this one person so from there they started to figure out the the phonetics the phonology of of ancient egyptian hieroglyphs and and they slowly started to, to undo it and then from there the entire rest of e ancient egyptian culture and society came almost like a bubbling out from the ground as a result of this discovery and i just think like so many crazy archaeological discoveries, and this is the story that we're trying to tell here, so many crazy archaeological discoveries come from just random happenstance moments. Like um, the, the Parthenon in Greece, the Acropolis. You know why it's ruined? It's because in a war, the Venetians stored their ammunition there. They stored their gunpowder there. And a stray bullet caught it and they accidentally blew up the Acropolis. So, so that's a thing. Apparently the Sphinx doesn't have a nose because Napoleon's troops used it as target practice. I don't know how true that last one is, but random little things through war have such lasting effects on our understanding. Like the next great leap in, in archeology span or in history could be made by you just walking down the street. Just pay attention to what's going on. Ask questions continually ask questions be curious don't just assume that we know all the answers because we don't we're not even close to knowing these answers and i think it's that kind of mystery that kind of curiosity that kind of 
magic of the past is what I'm really trying to encapsulate in this particular zoo. Because it's not really about the animals for me in this zoo anymore. It's about where the animals are and the stories that I'm trying to tell. And I just find that fascinating. That, you know, I'm sitting here playing a game in the country where I live, the city where I live, talking about 3,000-year-old temples on YouTube, and people all over the world are listening to it. There's... Uh, what a time to be alive, to quote Two Minute Papers. What a time to be alive. And there we have, ladies and gentlemen, the finished Chthonic Temple 2, I guess, Anubis? Yeah, I mean, we did a lot of work out here as well. All of this got kind of filled in. I did all this foliage down here. This still is a work in progress, but you know, we're starting to see a little bit more what this is capable of. We filled all of this in this area right down here. I think it's going to be a badger habitat, maybe? Haven't quite decided what goes in there just yet. But on to the main event of the evening, the temple. So we've got two obelisks here capped with gold. We've got the gold hieroglyphs written on the side. I've got a, this is as close to a carved like bas relief or, or demi relief um, statue of Anubis I could get. And we've got hieroglyphs up here. And we've got gold, a warning over the temple. But as you walk in, we've got hieroglyphs on the walls that's pretty cool and the reason people are looking at these is because hidden behind here i have conservation boards eh eh so they're actually learning as they're going through here and then we go into the hypo style hall everything is lit by torches i'm a little bit disappointed at the fact that this is so bright back here that's because the amount of ground oh over that's over the uh that's over the temple isn't thick enough to block the light because apparently ground is translucent and we've got offerings to the temple to, to the gods of the temples uh, yeah at first i thought that these were going to be like canopic jars and things but that seemed a little bit too dark for what i was going with and for can can canopic jars is where they store the removed brains and stomach and lungs of of mummies um after they've been mummified because if you leave them in the body they will they'll rot so say so we have six we have six animal uh, eight animals here we've got the fire salamander that's lovely we've got the terrapin because there's only two african exhibit animals that are like from north africa here we've got the giant forest scorpion lovely right next to it we have the desert hairy scorpion very, very cool. There is a passageway through here, because I was thinking that there might be a little bit more back here, but I'm not entirely sure. I think this is all that we need. And we've got the Sacred Scarab Beetle, because it's Egypt. Of course we have the Sacred Scarab Beetle. We've got the Western Diamondback. We have the Common Death Adder. And we have the Blue Tongued Lizard. This is everything that we've got that we've got down here, and I'm really pleased with it. I wish it were a little bit darker, but I think I might have to. You well, know, I might have to deal with some things up top in order to make that happen. And this is conveniently also one of the. Whoops, let's get that on. This is one of the cooler places in the entire zoo because, as we, because I've got four air conditioners down here because as you go into the temple it gets cooler so it's drawing people in it's drawing people past these education boards which means my guest education rating is absolutely skyrocketing now i've never ever had a five star guest education rating but we are getting there we've got talks for everything we've got conservation boards which are lovely i mean we've even got some yeah we've even got some back here in the, I'm very pleased with how this is turning out. I'm very pleased with this, how this is turning out. But now I have 1,800 people in the zoo, which is lovely. But, yeah. So if you guys have any questions, hit me up. And if any of you can try to guess what this hieroglyph say, this isn't real hieroglyphs. 
This isn't real hieroglyphs. This is just a hieroglyphic font. So each of these characters represents an English letter. So if you can guess what you think this means, I'll give you something. I don't know. I'll name a beetle after you. <laughs> something. But anyways, that's uh, what we've got. Whew. This zoo is really starting to come together. It's starting to kind of really be what I wanted it to be. We've got the little village over here. We've got the fennec foxes. I'm very pleased with everything so far. I think next is, yeah, maybe badgers just to fill up that area. And then we start working down here. We start filling in this a little bit more. We definitely work up top a little bit more. Maybe I turn this, I think I'm going to turn this into like a marketplace. I don't know. But for now, thank you very much for watching. If you like what you see, please like, please subscribe, please comment. Most importantly, and I do mean this, and I say this every time. Oh, oh, it's dark. So let's see what this looks like inside. Yes. Yes, look at all that lovely torchlight. And I do mean this, though. Have a fantastic day. Have an absolutely fantastic day. And I will see you all next time in Carzu, Alexandria. Bye, everybody.